Uh, my name is Daniel Chadash from Twist Bioscience. I'm delighted to be here for the first time in IPRESS, and we hope to come back every year as we make our technology work for digital preservation. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, first start with why do we even need a new uh, data storage medium? What are the challenges with um, tape, hard disk drives, and other technologies that are being used today? So we've seen magnificent progress in tape and uh, hard disk drive in the few last decades. They've been scaling up the capacity and the speed, but what we are seeing in the past few years is that this progress is slowing down because they're reaching their physical limits. And the, the demand doesn't stop. You all see that from your work. Uh, you keep on getting much more requests for more and more data to store. And based both on Gardner and IDC, uh, the supply can't keep up with the demand. <coughs> we, they expect a zettabyte scale supply gap in the second half of this decade. The other challenge is media diversity. And as you all know, it's a good practice in digital preservation uh, to have some like a diversity in your technologies that you are using and the media that you are using that you won't be dependent on only one. And these days, tape is really the only true archival storage medium that we have today. And if you move your uh, data to the cloud, it still puts it on tape. It just moved the problem to uh, a different entity. Uh, the next challenge is the longevity of the current storage media. Um, you are tasked with the task to preserve data for tens or hundreds or thousands of years, and you don't have a currently a storage medium that fits this task. And this means that you all need to do migrations, and you all know the pain with migrations, that you need to do it every seven to 10 years, the cost, uh, it's prone for errors, and uh, resources that it takes to do those migrations. And eventually, there is a challenge with sustainability. As the data grows, um, we are using more and more uh, uh, devices that are not recyclable, that take up energy, and have a large uh, carbon footprint. This is why we need a new storage medium, which is actually the oldest storage medium. This is what nature has invented to store data. What we are, what the organisms around us are, uh, the DNA is just instructions for the body on how to uh, build who we are. And the nice thing about DNA, this is not a thing that we just now invented and we have no idea how it behaves. DNA was studied for many, many years, and uh, we know it very well. Uh, we develop very good and accurate uh, processes to write and read DNA. This is what was referred to synthesis and sequencing. And the concept, as, as uh, Pierre showed, is very simple. We uh, represent the bits in the letters of DNA. So DNA is based from four letters, A, C, T, and G. These are the building blocks. And this is just like the ones and zeros of a computer. And what it allows us is it, it enables us to really deliver century-scale archive storage solutions, things that can stay for centuries and even more. A very uh, unique property of DNA is that it's a true software-defined storage. Um, the data is actually the medium. So those A, C, T, and G are the ones that are building the media. You don't get an empty media like a hard disk drive or a CD-ROM. You just, once it comes out of our factory, a twist, it comes out with the data on it. Um, another important property is it's a very stable format that we will always be able to read DNA. So it's not unlike the floppy disk that I saw in one of the tables out there that will have a very hard time to find a computer today that can read a floppy disk or a CD-ROM. With DNA, we'll always be able to read it. And this is very important for digital preservation, as you guys don't want to be dependent on a certain technology or a company uh, that will be available once you want to read your data. Uh, so we don't have versions of DNA, like DNA 2.1 or 2.7 or DNA 7, and you're expecting DNA 8 in the next year. So DNA is DNA, and we're able to read DNA that we find in bones that are uh, aged for tens of thousands of years or even more. So basically, DNA, it, it's delivering a very unique value proposition for archival storage and for you guys for digital preservation. And this is why we are here, because it's very important for us, this uh, industry of digital preservation. As you can see here, um, this is not the real size of this capsule. You on here has the, oh, it's here. We'll transfer it after, but this is the, the capsule. It's kind of like half of the pinky finger. And as you can see here by the numbers, it's like you can put 40, uh, 450 exabytes on a gram of uh, DNA, as Pierre showed before. And to answer the questions that was uh, in the previous session, then where is DNA based in the storage pyramid? Then it is under tape. Like we're talking about access time of hours. The capacity is much larger than, than what we have seen in the past and the durability is really, really high. 
What we are doing today at Twist is um, this capsule. Today we're doing it in a megabyte uh, size, but we're soon going to do gigabyte and terabyte after. A bit about the technology. I won't dive too much into it because we don't have much time, but these are the basic six steps that we have seen before. Uh, we encode every digital file, the ones and zeros, into AGCNT. Synthesis, we write it to DNA, we put it in those capsules. Once we want to read it, we open that capsule, we do the sequencing process, and then we do the decoding back into, into the file and the ones and zeros. Now, for the question on how do we make this a reality that will be in the data center or will be in your hands, so the way we see it at Twist, we see uh, two concepts, two kind of solutions. One of them is the vault. We call it the century archive. Um, this is what you are used to today when you disconnect a tape or a hard drive and you put it in a vault or in a third party, uh, so it will be air-gapped and hacker-safe. Uh, for DNA, the maintenance costs are even lower than what you have with tape because you don't need to do those migrations every seven to ten years. You don't need special climate control or special temperature in order to keep those capsules uh, fresh and good. Uh, the footprint is much lower, so in case you have an issue of renting a big space because of the amount of tapes you have, then with DNA you won't have this issue. And as I said, you can read it with standard DNA sequencer, so you're not, you're not dependent on us in order to read the data back, which is super important. And it will give you the lowest long-term TCO because you don't have maintenance costs and migrations and the cost is basically flat over time. The second solution is the library one. We call it the accessible archive. This is a solution that is ready for a data center. This is much more automated with all the standard interfaces and the form factor. So it can fit in the standard rack that you have in the data center, connects with the standard electricity and the temperature control and all that you have in a data center. And uh, also to answer the other question, this will integrate with the current storage and software application. So you won't need to write DNA slash slash in order to get to that. Like the storage application will know how to do that for you. Once you give a policy that say if a file is older and has not been accessed for two years, move it to DNA. Um, and we want to make sure that it can be operated by an IT team, so you won't need biologists in your team in order to operate that. So this is the challenge that we are working on. And, uh, because this is why you would use it. If you'll need biologists and if you'll need to handle chemicals, you won't use it. You want something that is easy to use like you're using today. Uh, the status of those uh, two solutions. So um, the Vault concept we're already doing today. We're doing pilots and Yon will talk about a pilot that we did with them. We're going to scale it to gigabytes soon and after that we'll do terabytes. Uh, in case you're interested, you can come to me after. We can talk about doing a pilot for you guys if you're interested to experience this technology. Uh, on the accessible archive, on the data center solution, uh, we're on the requirements and design phase, and over there we're also looking for technology partners, so companies or customers that want to give input on that, then we're also open for discussions. Um, these are still the challenges that we need to solve, the key technology enablers. I won't get into that in the, uh, because of the short time. Um, so the technology is not just enough. We can't do just one company with one technology and then like have a, a thing that you guys will all use. You want to see an ecosystem. An ecosystem is important not because to have other products, but also to create trust. And trust is really important when you launch a new uh, storage medium. So this is why we started the DNA Data Storage Alliance. We started in October 2020, two years ago. Uh, this is kind of like the DPC for digital preservation, but we did for DNA storage. Uh, we did with uh, Illumina, Microsoft, and Western Digital. Uh, now we have around 40 members, and you can see the names. We have a backing of like the biggest names in the storage industry are also uh, uh, they are, they are backing this up and part of this alliance. And the goal is to create an interoperable storage ecosystem. Um, the idea is that you can take a solution from one company and it will work with another company solution, and you won't be close to one company or a closed garden like we have with some other products. We don't want to create what happened with Blu-ray and AGDVD, that it was split into two formats and customers were not sure what to buy and uh, it created like uh, confusion in the customer side. So what we're doing over there, we are uh, trying to educate the market and explain that it's coming soon. It's no longer sci-fi. This is working technologies that we are now scaling it up. Um, we are developing a roadmap so we can give some predictions on the future and when, when it will arrive to the data center and we develop standards and specs as needed by the ecosystem. Last slide, um, here you can see some logos of, uh, of people that are here. Um, we mainly did pilots in digital preservation um, and we stored different types of uh, data on there. 
And we'll focus now on one from uh, Yale, and we work with you on to um, do a full pilot. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> So um, I thought I'd start, I'm going to be very quick, but I thought I'd start just by highlighting some of the things that have been talked about in regards to Write Once Media in, and its relationship with digital preservation over time. Um, so there have been a number of challenges that I've seen highlighted. One is the trustworthiness and reliability of long-term um, Write Once storage. Uh, a second is verifiability. How do you make sure it's still um, storing what it's meant to be storing over time? A third is that in digital preservation, often people want to be able to change data over time, and that can be problematic if you're using storage that you can only write to. And then the fourth is um, a lack of compelling requirement. Um, up to date, most people are still just using storage that is replaced on a regular basis. There hasn't been a compelling requirement given for needing something that you won't need to, re, uh, to change at all um, over a very long time. So to address those very quickly, um, DNA as a storage mechanism is, already has a proven life, a like proven long life. Um, it's also very cheap to make extra copies, so that you could make so many extra copies that if every few years or every month even you wanted to uh, read one and potentially destroy that copy in the process, um, you could afford to do so because it is extremely cheap to make extra copies. Um, in terms of changeability, <laughs> This is a personal perspective from me, but I'm a big proponent of emulation. I'm doing a talk about that at 4.30, I think, in this room. Um, but that gives us, if we use an emulation-based approach, that's an additive approach where you really just need to add another emulator every period of time to your storage um, if you want to keep your data accessible over time. So that would mean that things, any type of write once um, store forever media can be used um, to store things and keep them accessible over time if you're making them accessible using emulation. And then finally, we seem to be in, in one of the most uh, tumultuous geopolitical times uh, at the moment. There's a lot going on that could cause a lot of um, instability over coming years. So I think we've got a more, at this point in time, we seem to have some of the, the most compelling um, reasons to start looking at this kind of storage and taking it seriously. All right, so we did a, a, a pilot with Twist. It was a little over a year ago now. This is the result, 50 copies of um, the data that we sent to Twist uh, stored as DNA in these capsules. I have one with me here in a prototype case that I can um, show anyone that wants to have a look. Uh, this is what was, was involved. So there's about 16 megabytes of data in there, six ebooks from our um, medical historical library. Uh, we work with the librarians there and they pick some things that seem to be on topic. Um, and we um, successfully read it back using uh, w working in collaboration with the genomics team at um, the Department of Genetics. Uh, and then we decoded it in digital preservation using a, a container, a Docker container that we were given by Twist. All right, um, there's some photos of the lab where they did the reading of the data, some of the machines and processes they used. Happy to talk about these more. I kind of know something about them now. This is a really cool portable one that they can take to like uh, countries that don't have many resources and they can do uh, the sequencing on site. And that's the, um, the decoding that I did just in a virtual machine. And it was really quite straightforward. And it worked. The hashes matched. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was a very lovely presentation with a lot of information, and you went a little bit over time, so we may not have the time for so many questions. We've got a couple from online. Um, so, uh, we've got one from Adam Harwood. What does DNA storage mean for the archivist day to day? Will we have to do anything differently? <laughs> yeah, so. Um, the way we showed the, the, the solution that we just showed is to kind of keep your day-to-day -day the same. That's the goal, is to keep it something that won't require you to learn a new technology or new techniques or hire new people. That, I think, is, can be a success of any new, any new technology if it can be integrated into your day-to-day -day without large changes. Um, so when we build this system, we want to connect it to all the software interfaces so it will have the object storage, the F3 APIs, or connect to a software like Archivum or any other software that manages uh, uh, storage. So for the archivist perspective, it will be like a day-to-day, -day, just to define another rule. If this file has, hasn't been touched for many years, move it to DNA, and that's it. I think we could take a small question from the audience, and then we will... Yeah. 
Uh, hi, Daniel, once again. Uh, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know, and I don't want to be alarmist, but isn't it a possibility, like when we write to DNA, that it might create some new virus that we won't be able to deal with? <laughs> yeah, that's a question we are asked a lot. Um, yeah, so the concept of uh, uh, DNA data storage is that uh, we make it on short sequences that are too short to have a virus on them, okay? And then they, they live uh, by themselves, and then when we do the process of decoding, we combine all of them together. Not just that, because we are doing the encoding, then we can control on certain sequences that won't appear in the resulting sequence. And uh, on top of that, we have this, the biosecurity uh, mechanisms that for companies that print DNA, like Twist, then we check every sequence that we get to print that it's not a known virus or something like that. So we have three levels uh, to make sure that nothing like that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.